Congress. And joining us now is Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland. He's the ranking member on the House Oversight Committee and was the lead impeachment manager for the second Trump impeachment trial. Uh, Congressman, um, this, this situation, which we which really kind of carried us for the last few uh, bits of our conversation around accountability, is something very, very important. It was something you emphasized a lot uh, during uh, the impeachment trials. It is something you uh, have emphasized uh, as recently uh, as, as a few weeks ago and all the noise around the judges. How do you assess the accountability uh, for Donald Trump versus the rest of us. <laughs> well, let's start with the rest of us, uh, you know, because I know that there's so many people in the country who are just enraged about um, Trump's Houdini-like ability mm. to get out of all these scrapes. But when you actually bear down on it, there's a lot of accountability that is in place, mm -hmm. like with the lawyers, like with Eastman, um, like with Chesborough. I mean, these people have fundamentally endangered their careers. Um, even with Trump, I mean, uh, he is an adjudicated rapist at this point, an adjudicated defamer of women in New York City. Uh, he also has this half a billion dollar price tag outstanding in debt that he owes for having engaged in banking fraud and insurance fraud. The problem is, is that people have seen these outrages and injustices committed over the years, and the justice system moves slowly because we believe in due process. Right. And people have an opportunity to be heard and so on. But accountability is coming every single day, and uh, the bottom has fallen out on Donald Trump. He is going down in court. Um, and whether it happens before the election or after, to me, it doesn't make that much of a difference because the public can see what he actually did. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make that much of... Oh, go ahead, Alicia. Well, I was just going to say, while there is this quest for uh, accountability from Donald Trump, you have this in entire sideshow that is going on with House Republicans. Finally, it seems, Representative Comer is admitting uh, that he has no evidence in his impeachment inquiry into President Biden, though he has invited President Biden to testify in an impeachment probe. I'm not certain how both things can be true at the same time. Riddle me that. Um, your sense, is this finally headed towards its ultimate dead end? Yeah, I mean, it ends not with a bang, but with a whimper. I think uh, they're calling for Joe Biden to come testify and invited him. Uh, I think I would recommend that he RSVP no to that. I mean, th th there have been, you know, 20 witnesses who've come in. Each one is supposed to be the star witness, the breakthrough witness, and they always turn out to be a Chinese spy, a Russian spy, a guy who's in uh, prison testifying from behind bars because he has defrauded Indian tribes out of tens of millions of dollars. And none of them has laid a glove on Joe Biden because he hasn't done anything wrong. And that has been the overwhelming weight of the evidence. So I think this is the most colossal and spectacular failure in the history of congressional investigations. And it's an absolute embarrassment to the GOP. And I think it's one of the reasons that all these Republicans are headed for the exit, including most recently uh, Ken Buck and Representative Gallagher. They've said they've had enough. They're down to a one vote margin. It's quite plausible if we get one Republican uh, to, you know, change his or her baseball cap that we could end up in the majority before this uh, wreckage of a Congress is over. It is. That, the, what you just described is such a unlike, it's just such a crazy scenario, but it's true. Literally, there's one one same Republican in the House of Representatives. Uh, knock on the Democrats' door when y'all get back, and perhaps we can see a Speaker Jeffries sooner than later. Uh, you, you know, Congressman, you made the point that the account of that whether uh, Donald Trump goes to trial and is convicted before or after, it, it 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 doesn't matter because the people will be able to see it. But. What, there's a real chance that Donald Trump could win re-election. I think the Biden campaign has more money. The Biden campaign has a better message. They definitely have a better candidate. A better record. Uh, a better record. Uh, to run. Like, they've done real, tangible things for the American people, from Internet access to um, expanding child care. Infrastructure. Like infrastructure. Infrastructure week to happen. Donald Trump was promising it for four years. Still ain't seen it <laughs> under him. But Joe Biden brought us infrastructure week. But even still... There are people out there supporting Donald Trump. And so what happens if, in fact, he wins when you have things like Comer saying, 
we now they've moved from we want to hear Biden testify. And, you know, either way, we're just going to recommend some criminal con criminal liability over onto the Justice Department in well, the hopes that Trump yeah. wins and takes it up like this. A criminal, diabolical. a criminal referral requires a crime. If they'd found a crime, they would be impeaching him for it. They didn't find any crime. Mm -hmm. The only crimes we've identified are by their own witnesses all over the country. I mean, one of the guys um, is uh, a Chinese intelligence asset mm -hmm. who's on the run from American justice. That and then, of insane. course, the whole thing started with this guy, Alexander Smirnoff, who just repeated lies that were being told by Rudy Giuliani. And we got... Rudy Giuliani's right-hand man, Lev Parnas, to come in to say they did everything they could all over Europe, all over the world, to find some dirt on Joe Biden, and they couldn't find it because there's nothing there. And Parnas, who was, you know, Gi Giuliani's uh, alter ego, said it's time to call off uh, the whole wild goose chase. So, Congressman, I want to shift gears a little bit because this is, I want to step up the level of accountability here in, in this narrative. You had, an, in the last few days, uh, the Trump campaign and Trump himself putting out uh, a violent image mm. of, of President Biden. Um, NBC, uh, Megan Lebowitz reporting uh, this, Trump sharing this video uh, image depicting Biden tied up in the back of a pickup truck. The uh, Biden campaign responded to this uh, violent truth social post noting this image from Donald Trump is the type of uh, crap you post when you're calling for a bloodbath or when you tell the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. Trump is regularly inciting political violence, and it's time people take him seriously. Just ask the Capitol Police officers who were attacked protecting our democracy on January 6th. That is an in-your-face response, which I thoroughly appreciate it. Um, but a more serious tip is... You have a former president posting a picture of a current president in a violent situation in which, you know, given some of his supporters, may actually go out and try to actualize that. So two parts. One, what accountability should Donald Trump and his campaign be held to uh, on that? And two, what, if anything, should Secret Service be saying to Trump uh, as they would say to if I had posted that video or Simone had posted that video? Um, yes, because the laws against making threats against presidential candidates apply also to presidential candidates. Right. Mm -hmm. Just because you're running for president doesn't mean that you can't be held accountable for violent threats you make. But the accountability... Michael, has got to be by the American people fundamentally. I mean, somebody could file a complaint against somebody, and we know that Trump will drag that out. But what we've got to see is that the all the characteristics of an authoritarian or a fascist political party are right there now, OK? Number one, they don't accept the outcome of Democratic elections if they don't go their way. Number two, they embrace political violence or they refuse to renounce political violence as an instrument for obtaining political power and maintaining it. And three, they're organized around a cult of personality of a charismatic or allegedly charismatic political figure whose word is elevated above the rule of law and above the Constitution. So I think the in the first instance, the political accountability must be directed at members of the GOP who have not fled for the exits, right. like Gallagher and Ken Buck, who are saying, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I've got a career. i got a family. I don't want to be associated with a political party that's going down in flames like that. Good point. I have one final question for you, Congressman. Um, some reporting this week from Politico about House Democrats pushing for a hearing on Jared Kushner's business dealings. Make the argument to me that even if Trump doesn't win a second term, this is still important if Democrats win the majority. Well, the cardinal principle that was put in the Constitution that we haven't had to talk about much over the last couple of centuries is that it's not a money-making operation for the president. The president go in, doesn't go into business, which is why we have the Foreign Emoluments Clause, which says that a president or any other federal official cannot accept a present and emolument, which means a payment, an office or a title of any kind whatever from a king, a prince, a foreign state without the express consent of Congress. There's also a domestic emoluments clause, which says that the president is confined to his salary in office and cannot collect other money from the federal government or other kinds of sources. And, of course, Donald Trump and his family say, oh, well, he didn't accept 
his government salary. I'm sorry, that's all you're allowed to accept. <laughs> it's not like you can say, I'm not going to take my salary and I'm going to go on the payroll for the Chinese government or the Saudis or the United Arab Emirates. But that's what he did. And we've documented in our report, White House for Sale, $8 million of documented receipts that he got from foreign governments, which just scratches the surface because that was just for two years. It was just for four businesses out of more than 500 that we were able to get uh, the data on. If he, if he were, God forbid, to get back in, it would be uh, all bets are off, a complete money-making operation, and he would loot uh, the entire U.S. government because we haven't even gotten to the domestic government side of it. So uh, th that's what we're talking about. This election is about two fundamentally opposed public philosophies. One says government has to be an instrument for the common good, the public interest of all the people to advance the well-being of the people. The other says the government is a money-making operation. It is a for-profit business for the guy who gets in and his family. And that's what America's got to see here. Mm. He's literally selling Bibles. It's crazy. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.